Hi everybody, today's video is all about the life of a professional dancer. You've been asking me what does it entail, what does it involve, and so I hope I answer some of your questions today. I will most likely expand on this in different kind of ways, in different topics in the future, get into more detail. But today is just kind of the, the overview. Uh, for both students who want to be professionals as well as people who have no intention of being a professional dancer but you just are interested to know what the life is like. The biggest thing about the, the life of a professional that I had to learn very very early on is that you definitely fend for yourself. Unlike being a student where the school is there to nurture you, you know, they really keep tabs on you, they tell you when something is going wrong, they, it, you're just very very nurtured. As a professional, you are expected to be in class every day. You are just expected to take care of yourself. You are expected to know your roles. Um, it's kind of, you, you kind of are on your own a bit. I learned that in that I was at SAB for two years, the School of American Ballet, and I was hired by New York City Ballet at the end of my junior year of high school. So I was not even a senior yet. I, had, I was finishing up my junior year. And to be thrust into a full-time, six days a week, 10-hour job um, when I was barely 17, it was just, you know, it was a huge learning curve. I had to grow up very, very quickly. It's not like being a ballet student. That is the number one thing. If you think that, oh, just like ballet school, it'll be exactly the same thing as the company. Absolutely not. You are pretty much responsible for you, and you've got to step up to the plate. As an early apprentice, young core member your first couple of years, even if you're hurting, you have to be in class every day. Once you've kind of established yourself, you've gotten some roles or they know what you can do, then if you're hurting um, or you have an injury, you can kind of, you know, play it, pull back in class a bit. Um, but if I ever was in a lot of pain, I just wouldn't jump in class. I'd leave early to prepare for my rehearsals. But the first couple of years, like it or not, you've got to be doing all of class every single day because you're really trying to establish yourself. You need to make sure that, that the directors, the ballet masters are seeing you because you're trying to, to vie for a part now. It's not just about, you know, being in the school and they're gonna cast and everything. No, you've got, you are up against, you know, big pros. So you really have to make a name for yourself very, very early. The other thing that's so interesting as a student, especially in a situation like SAB and New York City Ballet, is that when you're taken into a company, usually you're the cream of the crop in your school. You are the top dancers of your class, you're the best. The minute you join a company, you are back at the bottom, back at the lowest point of the totem pole, and you have to re-earn your way back up. So that can be very, very hard, especially if you're a student who's gotten a lot of parts in your school. Know that when you get in the company, you are back at the bottom. You are understudying everything. You are learning everything. You might not necessarily be dancing everything. I learned so many ballets my first year that I never performed. It's just part of paying your dues. You have to know that being a young dancer in a company, you are going to pay your dues. It's not necessarily going to be grand and glorious your first year. Um, I love being honest with all of you. That's kind of why I do this channel. I was very, very fortunate in that one of the very first things I did with New York City Ballet as an apprentice was Juliet. Um, I was 17 and to get a role like that is very, very unheard of. Um, it does not usually happen at all. Um, so I will say that yes, you know, you all know my story. I danced Juliet at 17 as a apprentice, but let me just be 100% honest with you. That doesn't usually happen. You really have to pay your dues. I honestly lucked out into that. A dancer got injured and they thought for some, whatever reason that I was the right part, person for the part and I got to do it. But the rest of the year, most of the first six months I was an apprentice, I really, you know, I did every single Nutcracker performance. We did 46 Nutcrackers in which I did uh, Snow and the Core of Spanish, all 46. So I didn't just come in with the blaze of glory despite getting Juliet. I still had to do every performance of Nutcracker, every single show, every Snow, every Core of Spanish. Um, and it's not all wonderful. I mean, it was really hard to make a show 46 times in a row the same thing. Um, so just know that if you're a young dancer, and any of you who aren't dancers, the young ones are paying their dues. Um, that's, that's another big thing you have to get used to. Again, that being in the top of your school and getting into the company and you are back at the bottom. Going back to when I told you that I was hired as a junior in high school, being thrust into a position of a full-time, six-day-a-week, 10 hours a day job at 17, again, is a big shock. So I learned very, very early on how to take care of myself, what to eat, how much sleep to get, 
Um, you don't, you know, as a student, you kind of think, oh, whatever, and I'm young and I can eat chips for lunch and, you know, I can stay up and blah. Not when you're a professional. You learn very quickly that it is all about taking care of yourself because if you don't, you will get injured very quickly. Thankfully, I only had one real minor, it wasn't a terrible injury, I only had one injury the entire time I was at New York City Ballet, and it was a sprained ankle. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully didn't have to have any surgery, didn't, you know, have any huge problems, and I think it's because I take care of, I really took care of myself. Most of the dancers do, and sometimes it's just a fluke, they, they ought to, you know, rip, rupture an Achilles or something, or it can be a fluke accident, but it's so important to take care of yourself, and you learn that very, very early on. So typical day of a professional dancer. I'm going to use New York City Ballet as an example. Again, I'm not going to get too detailed because it's not my place to sort of spill all the secrets, um, but this just pretty much goes for any company. You have, within a season, you have two sort of time periods. One is called the rehearsal period, where you're doing nothing but rehearsing the ballets for the upcoming season, and there are no performances at night. And then the other time of the, the season is, the, is performing. And days vary depending on if it was rehearsal period or performance we were performing. So during the rehearsal period, we had 10.30 to 12 a.m. class every day, six days a week. I've had a lot of people who aren't dancers say to me before, why do you still take ballet class? Haven't you learned it all yet? Ballet class is not about learning steps once you're a professional. It's about keeping your technique in check and warming you up for the day. It would be, to, to give you an analogy, it would be like an opera singer still taking voice lessons to maintain their voice, to keep their voice going, things like that, or a Broadway person still taking class to just hone and keep themselves in shape. Basically, that's what ballet class is for professionals. So every day we had an hour and a half ballet class um, to just, again, warm us up, keep our technique in check. Then we would rehearse about six hours a day at most. We would do 12 to 3 and with a break and then 4 to 7 when we were not performing. That's rehearsal period. During a performance period, we have 10.30 to 11.30 class, only an hour because you don't want to tax yourself too much. That performance period is just about that class, again, maintaining your technique, but more, mostly warming you up for the day. And then you would still rehearse to uh, 12, 11.30 to 2.30, I believe, and 2.30 to 5.30, because performances were either at 7.30 or 8. And if you had the performance that night, you stopped rehearsing two hours before to give you time to get ready the, for the performance. If you didn't have the performance that night, you could rehearse up until 7. Um, but if you did, you had to have at least two hours before to prepare. So in that performance season, where you're doing the hour class, then the three-hour rehearsal, three-hour rehearsal, and then you get the, the two hours off before the performance, that's your time to get physical therapy. Sometimes we'd get a massage, we'd eat something, and then we'd start preparing for the performance. And the other difficult thing about being the dancer is that you have to peak during the day at the very end of the day. After you've already done seven hours of dancing, your best dancing has to be at 8 p.m every night. So that's, you You learn very early on how to pace yourself. You know, if you have a really tough performance that evening, you have to kind of pull back during the day because you want to be, you know, in top form at 8 p.m., not at 3 p.m. So that's another thing you learn very early on is how to manage your time, how to pace yourself, how to know to push to your limit but not beyond. And so then you can perform. And I Again, it's one of the things I learned when I told you I had the one injury. It was a day where I had a lot of rehearsals, and I pushed way too far, and the ballet master said again, 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 and I didn't say, no, I need to stop. I pushed too far, sprained my ankle, and was out for two months or something. So you have to know how to pace yourself. Um, ballet dancers are constantly, if you've ever taken a class, let's say at a place like Steps, if you're ever in New York, you take a place at Steps, a, a, a studio where anybody can take class. Often the professionals are in the advanced ballet classes there. And you ever see a professional walk out early, don't judge them. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, she didn't take all the class. Why didn't she take all the class? She didn't jump today. It's because they know exactly how much to pace themselves. They might have a really hard show that evening. Their calves might be in total knots from the performance the night before. You know, if you ever see a professional leave a class early, it's because they know what they're doing. 
You know, you can have that uber hard work ethic, but only to a point. You don't want to be stupid about it. You know, don't push yourself to the point where you get injured. So professionals who leave class early are doing so because they are smart. They are not being lazy. You can't be a lazy ballet dancer. That's another tip. If you have plans to be lazy for your job, ballet probably isn't the, isn't the right career for you because you cannot be lazy to be a ballet dancer. The other difficult thing about being a professional that I learned as I went along is that yes, you peak, like we said, at that 8 p.m. time. You do your performance, you are done at around 11, you go to bed, and guess what? You have to do it all again the next day. You have to get up and be in that 10.30 ballet class every day, every single day. Um, so it's never about, oh, I did my fantastic performance, and that was it, and then you just get to wallow in luxury. No, you have to be in class the next day and do it all again, be on form for your, your rehearsals, be on form from the next evening's performance. Because as a young core member, not necessarily as an apprentice, but when you've been there a year or two, you get used for everything. You will be in every ballet, you will be on every night. Um, oftentimes being a core dancer, at least in my experience, being in the core is far more difficult than being a soloist or principal, because the core does everything. You think about Swan Lake, they're on the whole time, they do all those difficult steps, they have to stand there and grip their muscles, etc, etc. Being a core dancer is so difficult. And when you're in the core and you get a solo, it doesn't mean you still don't do your core roles. For example, when I was doing the Nutcracker, I got Sugar Plum my second year in the company, um, and I was still doing snow, I was still doing flowers, I was still doing the core of something else, I can't remember what it was. But it wasn't like, oh, she's doing sugar plum, so we're gonna take her out of everything else. No, the next day I had to get up and do snow. I had to do, do flowers. I remember I debuting sugar plum in a matinee. And after that matinee, the registrar, who kind of does all the casting and the scheduling, he came to me and he said, Katie, beautiful performance. I need you tonight. So and so is injured. Can you do flowers? And it was like, okay. I have to do the evening show even though I just did Sugar Plum, right? So at least with New York City Ballet and most other companies, when you do a big role like that, you're not fond and, and whatever. You have to get, you have to maybe do the core in that evening's show. So it's never about the glory. You know, you're always working, you're always improving. Um, you, you never have a moment of, I have made it, I am the star. So you're constantly improving. No, you're never gonna have a perfect show. If you're a student, you know this. There's always something to work on. There's always something to make better. Um, you're never gonna have a per perfect performance. If you do, stop, because then you have achieved it. Um, I never had a perfect show. I had some really, really good ones, but there's always something to work on. So you're never gonna have a perfect performance. Um, and there's never a point where you should think that I am the star, I deserve things. You can get into a lot of trouble if you start to think that you deserve things as a ballet dancer. You have to earn them. You really have to earn them. Um, because otherwise you'll be miserable. Because they have to see that you can, you can pull your weight in things. So don't ever think that, again, that once you make it, I'm just going to get roles. You still have to earn them. It's never about being the star. Because in a company setting, again, you have multiple principles. It's never, there's never one ballerina or one male dancer. New York City Ballet has 20 plus principals. ABT has a lot of principals. So it's never just about you. It's about other people. You're, you're working with a group of people. You're going to share roles with people. It's never, you're never just gonna do one role all to yourself. It's very rare. Um, so never, I encourage you all, if you wanna be a dancer, don't get to the point where you think you deserve things or you think it's gonna be all about you because it's not. So going back to the rehearsal period, we learned, I could be doing, rehearsing six different ballets a day. That's just how it, it works. You might do 12 to one, you know, Snow and Nutcracker, and then one to two, Something in Sleeping Beauty, and then, you know, two to three, Concerto Barocco. It just, it, it never is about, at least with New York City Ballet and most companies, Okay, today we're just rehearsing Nutcracker. It never happened. We would do a million ballets every single day. You would get an hour off for lunch. You could never do more than three hours without an hour break. Um, but again, you could be rehearsing six hours a day in addition to the class. So it's a lot of work. Um, those of you who are not dancers, essentially being a ballet dancer is being a professional athlete. Um, so, you know, it's not about tutus and tiaras and pink, you know, 
jewelry box dancers to go around. I mean, there's very, I only probably wore a pink tutu once. Sugar Plum and Aurora are the only two roles that require pink tutus. So everything else, you know, you're, you're, it's athletic. You're an athlete. Um, and part of being that elite athlete is, is dancing that many hours a day. The class in the morning and then six hours of rehearsal. That's the other thing that's very hard to get used to from the jump as a student to a professional. When you're a student, you probably dance, I'd say maybe four to five hours a day, maybe six at most. When you're a professional, it's A+. Plus. So you're constantly on your feet. The other thing students forget is that when you get into a company, and even company members forget this, it's a business. You know, ballet companies are a business. It's not just about, let's put on a show and make everybody happy and this and that and da 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 da. It's a business. And a lot of decisions that are made are business decisions. They have to sell tickets. You are being paid to do a job. The audience is paying to see you. So oftentimes when there are problems within the company, if the director says, you're not good enough, I have to pull you out of this role, or I think, you know, your body needs a bit of work, yes, it can be very, very harsh, but you have to remember it's a business. People are paying to see this aesthetic art, and that's what's so difficult about ballet. We don't need to see skinny, tiny twigs. I don't, I am not all for that. I've talked about this before. Um, if you have an eating disorder, I know I'm not here to judge you. Please get, you know, help if you can. I understand it is, is an illness. It's not just the fact that you just decided to stop eating. I understand that it's an illness. I don't advocate anorexic dancers in a company. I think it's so, so unhealthy. However, at the end of the day, it's an aesthetic art and you have to be, you know, somewhat thin. You have to be thin. That's just the reality of the situation. And if a director ever talks to you about your weight, when I was going through my thyroid illness at the beginning, when I was still, you know, dancing eight hours a day, I started putting on weight, they told me. They said, you're putting on weight, what's up? And while it was very harsh to hear, they had a point. It's a business. They're paying, the audience is paying to see a certain look on the stage and I wasn't, well, granted I wasn't eating, I wasn't having a problem, I was sick, it was an actual illness, but at the same time they had to say something because there's a certain expectation and that goes back to knowing how to take care of yourself, knowing how to stay in shape, um, being expected to look a certain way so you can fit the costume, you can, you can do the ballet because the audience is paying for it. You know, it's not a situation of, oh, we're just doing this for fun, oh, it should be a privilege to dance. It is an absolute privilege to dance, but it's also a business. So if you're a young professional and there are things going on that are tough, or a director has talked to you about your weight, I have been there, it's so difficult. I know, I, trust me, I've been in, in your shoes. When I was sick, they told me three times in one week that I was gaining weight. Obviously, I knew I didn't know why at the time. That's another story, which if you missed the thyroid story video, I will link it below. Um, that kind of explains a lot to you all on that. And yes, it was very, very harsh to hear, Katie, you know, you're not looking good. But at the end of the day, it's an aesthetic art. You're a ballet dancer. You have to look a certain way. You're paid to look a certain way, and an audience is paying to see you look a certain way. So that's what I advise you all to remember also, is yes, it does require a certain amount of of taking care of yourself. I, again, I do not advocate starting starving yourself. Absolutely not. Nothing at all. Do not starve yourself. You don't have to. When you're a ballet dancer, and that's another misconception, people think ballet dancers don't eat. If you're dancing 10 hours a day, it's like being in a gym 10 hours a day. You have to eat something. You could not do what you do if you didn't eat. Biggest misconception that I'm sure all the professionals out there are thanking me for saying, ballet dancers eat. You cannot not eat. Because again, if you were an athlete, 10 hours a day, six days a week, you would, we'd kill over. We wouldn't be able to dance. So ballet dancers do eat. So starving yourself doesn't help. <clears throat> That's another interesting thing is that if a student was at the school and they were not eating and they got taken into the company, they learned very, very quickly 
that they had to eat something because again that jump from four hours a day to ten hours a day you have to eat otherwise you'd you'd keel over so that is a huge misconception I do not advocate starving you don't have to you know if you eat a very healthy diet and you do all of that exercise when you're in a company you're going to be thin you know you're going to, to be fit and you're going to be the, the shape you need to be so it's not a thing of I'm sitting here saying well you have to starve and you can't eat and you should be living on lettuce no you're going to get there naturally just by virtue of what you're doing so just be healthy and you can get there but in my case with my illness and I started putting on weight yes it was very very harsh to hear them say that to me but at the end of the day, again, it's a business, and they have every right to. Going along that theme a little bit, another thing to note is that there are always multiple casts. As a business, they like to give people opportunities. So it's never just going to be, um, with very, very few exceptions, um, you're going to have, if you get a principal role, you're going to be the only one doing it. For example, there were four Juliets. When Nutcracker rolls around, there are probably 20 sugar plums. Um, so everybody, they want to give people a chance. You know, again, it's not just about that one person. Um, Aurora's, there were six of us, I think. So don't ever assume that you're going to get a role and it's going to be yours and nobody's ever going to get it but you. No, you are, you are privileged to be doing that role and other people need a chance too. So you're going to be sharing the roles. You're going to get, there are going to be multiple casts. Um, so that's something just to be aware of also. Because in the school, oftentimes if you perform as a student, you don't share a role. You will get that role, you'll do the performances and that's it. But in a company professional setting, there will be multiple casts, multiple dancers doing the role. My biggest misconception when I first joined New York City Ballet is I thought, okay, this is it. I've made it. It's going to be wonderful from here on out. No, it is work. Ballet is work. And if you want to be a professional, my biggest advice to those of you who want to be a professional is you must absolutely love it. You must be willing to sacrifice a lot for it because it is really really hard. Um, I had a very, very fortunate career and then I got roles right off the bat. Again, like I told you, I love being honest. That's very rare. It's very rare that you'll get a role right off the bat. Usually it's two plus years before you get your first solo. And I, but I was so fortunate that I didn't have to wait those two years and it was still really hard for me. It was really hard. It's a lot of work. There is a lot of competition, even though the stories of the glass and the point shoes kind of thing is not true. You do become a family in a way, but like every family, you have problems in between people. But at the end of the day, you are a big family. But there's a lot of competition, you know, like it or not, people all want the same roles. I think I told you in some other video that there, in the whole New York City Valley, there were four Juliets and 60 plus women in the company. So you're all vying for so, for so few spots. So there is a lot of competition. There's a lot of, you know, heartbreak, and, and, you know, people don't understand what happens and why'd she get this part and why'd she get, didn't get that part, etc. So you really have to love it. You have to be willing to work for it more than you ever, ever knew. The glamour part of a being a ballet dancer is probably 20% of the time, maybe 10% of the time. That's the performing. The rest is honest to goodness work. It is work, it is sweat, it is blood, it is tears. Um, the, the wonderful part is that 10% of the time you're on the stage, which makes the rest of the day absolutely worth it. That's why we do it, that is, that is for that, the couple moments on stage. You know, that one hour on stage every night is why we do the seven plus hours every single day of the work. It's not all glamorous. If you're not a dancer and you go to see the ballet, know that those people on that stage genuinely love what they do. Because we don't do it for the money. I'm not going to talk about money, but you know, we don't make millions of dollars doing this. Maybe some of the big stars do, but dancers do not make fortunes. Um, we do it because we love it. We're up there because we genuinely love it, because it is a lot of work. It is more work than anybody can ever imagine. So if you are a student who thinks you might want to be a professional, I highly encourage you to really ask yourself if this is absolutely what you want to do because it is not all wine and roses. It is very much a lot of work. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to have a lot of heartbreak. That 10% of the time on the stage is absolutely worth it. Trust me, I wouldn't change a thing. I'd go through it all again. You know what I mean? But 
you have to, to love it, otherwise you will crumble under the pressure. So you guys, I could go on and on and on about this, but we'd be here until Sunday. So if there's anything I missed that you want me to talk about or you want me to discuss further, um, please let me know. This was kind of just an overview. I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of what the life is really like if you want to be a dancer or you have no clue what being a professional dancer really is. I hope I gave you some insight to that. If you missed my planche video, you can over there you can click it to watch. Coming next Tuesday, something you've all been asking for, and that is a summer course packing video. All my tips for how to pack for your summer course. Plus, in that video, there's going to be a giveaway, so stay tuned for that. Love you all so, so much. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.